Black and Gold Brothers, BGB Podcast. Me and my CD teammate, Charles Spurgeon Johnson. Uh, I see you there with your uh, Urkel size CU polo on. <laughs> hey, hey, bro, every time you say black and gold and I look at us on the screen, I said, it makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. This was why this was suggested. We still brothers, though. We still brothers. Yes, Another sir. brother, but we still brothers. We're still brothers, man. Hey, we working on how many years now? It's been about over 35 years, Chad. Man, since uh, 1988. I didn't meet you on my recruiting trip in 87, but uh, we've been rolling tight since 1988. Who was your recruiting? Uh, who was your host? Uh, Tim James was my main host, but Tim James and Sal were like boys. So That's outside right. of, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of time where I was alone with Tim, it was Tim and Sal who were my hosts. I went to a couple of parties, all that stuff. With, and you still decided guys. to come. And I still <laughs> decided to come. <laughs> That's awesome, man. You know, my hosts were Dave Brown. Okay. MJ Nelson. Uh-huh. You remember MJ? Of course I remember MJ. Dave, uh, uh, Dave Brown, MJ Nelson, and Ter Terry Johnson, the Golden Domer. Okay. Well, and I, uh, it's, I know you like for a quarterback, that's an interesting sort of group to be your host. I didn't visit Colorado until it's like June 5th. So we had already graduated from high school. I was going to Eastern Michigan and I was a late, late ad. That's why I ended up walking on. There were no scholarships left. But Mark Walters blew his knee out in that spring prior to. Uh -huh. And Sal was the only non-senior quarterback on the roster. And so Mac was in a panic to find another quarterback for the upcoming season. There were no other young quarterbacks. And so uh, that's that that's how it all unfolded for me. But I didn't visit until summer school was actually in. Okay, so that list of eclectic hosts now make a lot more right. sense. Right. I'm thinking if I'm a coach and I'm trying to recruit a kid out of Detroit – TJ, MJ, and definitely Dave Brown is not the guys I would assign to you now that I know you, and particularly know you coming from Detroit. Yes, and and I know you were thinking, I had to clarify that because I know you were thinking, they really didn't want CJ. <laughs> <laughs> we needed you, man. And, and, as, as fate would have it, true, but in 1987, you know, I don't know, maybe. maybe. It, but it, 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 it absolutely goes to show that when you are assembling an organization, when you are assembling a football team, every piece is important. So you may have just been recruiting for quarterback depth. Yes. But who knew that this guy that you, recorded, that you recruited for quarterback depth had the football character to be continually investing when there was always players in front of him investing in his football prowess that in the biggest moment, on the biggest stage ever for Colorado football history, that this would be the guy to lead you to the promised land. That, wow. That's now, I, I wanted to go a long time before I cussed, but that shit is bananas right now. Woo, this brother's preaching, y'all. Preach, preach. Wow. <laughs> right wow. On, <laughs> right on, CB. I didn't know, literally, they just went and grabbed some dudes who was on campus for summer school and was like, show this guy a good time. I mean, that's how much of a late ad slash afterthought you may yeah. have been. Yeah. But again, it just goes to show when you are bringing somebody in, you don't know when you're going to count on them, when you're going to need them. And, you know, it really is a, a, a true testament to life because there's nothing. And I know we're going to get to some football here in a second, maybe because we preaching, bro. Right. There is nothing that's really linear about this, linear about this experience we call life. So when I have an opportunity to go out and I speak to to youngsters about uh, about their future and about you know being motivated to do do wonderful things. That's the that's the core of the message. There's nothing linear about it. it it's not one plus one in life doesn't equal doesn't automatically or always equal two. Uh, and it's the unexpected that you have to expect and just be ready to adjust and you know keep your eye on the prize. But you got to be flexible in life. You got to know that it's not coming to you the way the script said it will. And just be prepared to keep it moving, man. Well, you are a living testament to to all of that. But to, to your point a second ago, we are going to talk about some football now. Oh, we are? Yes. 
Hey, your buffs I want to know, by the way. I don't know if you recognize it. Hearing some of the folks, hearing some of the some of the sky is falling people around here, you would think they were on one, but your buffs are one to know, Chad. The haters on the outside, they're not the only ones with a little bit of odd feelings about this one. In fact, Coach Prime in the presser after the game had some thoughts that weren't exactly uh, glowing in praise for his football team. We got a little bit of that sound right here. You won, but you didn't win. It's almost like uh, we had more points than they did. Um, giving up the last touchdown on the run, uh, that bothered me because we pride ourselves on going to get the quarterback and we have a multitude of young men that can go get the quarterback and we didn't get that done. But I'm, I'm thankful, I'm happy we got the W. Okay, man, I know we're going to get into some of the highlight reel stuff and some of the positives, but give me your instant reaction to, and I know it was Thursday, so it was days ago, but try to transport your mind back to how you felt late Thursday night with what the Buffs put on the football field. Oh, I, oh I'm glad you pointed out specifically to what the Buffs did on the football field because I was, I was feeling good. Man. Okay. By the way. But, uh, and was feeling good about the win as well. And I just, to, to, to Coach Prime's point, I think he, that's coach, that's coach speak, right? I mean, that's, that's right out of, out of central casting, right? Like we left a lot on the field. We won, but we didn't do blah, 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 blah. All that aside, I guarantee he's ecstatic that his team is one and know with the big one coming up this upcoming weekend. I know opening week of college football is crazy. And we've seen Florida state now at this point drop two in a row after being a top 10 ranked football team. So the lack of understanding of who your football team is, and it's not just at Florida State. It's not just CU and Coach Prime. It's all around the, the football landscape. That's why a lot of these really, really good teams, you know, scheduled teams that weren't so good in week one, so they get a bit of a mulligan, and the coach can actually see who can play, who can't play, who's ready for prime time, and who's not. Um, but my instant reaction was, of course, I was doing my game. I had North Carolina at Minnesota, and so they, the booth – next to the booth where I was broadcasting from, they were showing the bus game on TV. So I was watching it every commercial break that I could. But my instant reaction without seeing every single snap was they haven't changed the narrative. The folks who say they are a facade and don't believe in them can still feel exactly the same way because they barely beat an FCS team. Mm. The folks who believe in them uh, can say, you know what? We found a way to win in the second half. We, we compressed that first half uh, uh, of learning and of lessons into the second half, went out and won the second half. Wasn't perfect, but we still made some mistakes. But we are good enough to win football games when we don't play perfectly, when we yes. do make mistakes. Yes. And so the season is off and going in the right direction. So me, myself, I, I'm kind of in the middle of all that. My opinion hasn't changed much from where we talked uh, I think we talked Tuesday before yeah. this Thursday game last week. Shador Sanders is amazing, deserves to be a top five NFL draft pick at this point. Real deal. Travis Hunter may be the best player in college football, not just this year, but probably going back several years. That's right. But the question marks about the offensive line improved, but still some question marks, particularly in the run game. Defensive line got one sack. I know there was a sack by, I think, on a safety blitz. So there's still some question marks there. And that defense did not uh, look as improved as I think we would have liked to have seen them. Yeah. So uh, you've got some glowing points to, uh, that you made. I'm a little bit more, opti you know, cautiously pumped the brakes a bit. Do you see those same issues that I see? Uh, absolutely. Right. And, and I think we're looking at the same coin, right, from a slightly different angle. I, I think there's some cautious optimism on behalf of everyone. Nothing that happened last Thursday night completely changes the the narrative complete you know completely changes the narrative but here's what I would say I've never seen this dynamic at in CU athletics before there are and I'm beginning to appreciate this it's, it's not a good thing though there are willing active haters of this program now mm -hmm. who have traditionally I think been either sort of agnostic to or indifferent so that's one thing. So, I, you know, you, you kind of take the, the messaging with a bit of a grain of salt, depending on where it's coming from. CU's football team, their program as it's currently comprised, Chad, is not the Chad Brown, CJ, lead the nation in rushing, bludgeon you offense. That's not who we are. 
And consequently, here's where I think it, it actually leaves a question mark. I'm not sure if our defense, therefore, is hard enough, if you will, to just be a consistent run-stopping aggressive defense. I've always said defenses, to some degree, are predicated on what they see from their offenses. When you are a line of scrimmage, bloody your nose type offense, then you force the defense to, to practice and defend that on a day-to-day -day basis. When you're a spread sort of offense, then that's what your defense is practicing against, and that becomes sort of the personality of it. But we shouldn't expect this offense to be that. That's not who they are. They are a quarterback perimeter driven offense. Here's the number I look for. I don't look for CU to rush for 150 yards. I'm just concerned with what's what's the distance on second down. Mm. That's all I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. right? I, and I don't care how we get to second and six. Quite frankly, second and seven with, ex, with, with as explosive as this offense is. Give me second and seven or better. And we've done our job. However you get to it. That's the kind of offense this is. And so whether or not that shows up in an 84-yard rushing offensive effort or 184-yard rushing offensive effort, our bread is buttered when we have the whole playbook to play with on second down. Think about last year. How often were we just behind the chains after an offensive penalty, after a sack, where we were third and or second down and 13? You may as well punt. If we're second and seven, second and six, this offense is explosive. I think close to unstoppable. That's the key number that I'm looking at. I don't care how many yards in a given game we want. It's situational yards. If we can get to second and six, second and seven and better or better, we're going to be a good offense. Okay, so that's a unique way to look at the run game. It doesn't have to be seven yards to carry. We don't have to rush for 175 yards. But if we are efficient enough on first down, then that – forces the defense's hand to be middle of the road on second down. That's exactly right. I thought as I watched this game, I thought the only way we could would be stopped offensively is if we stopped ourselves. And a couple of times we stubbed our toe. We should have, I think this is a game, quite frankly, what do we end up scoring? 30, 31 points. 31 points. That's a 42 point game. I think that's an effort that, you know, I'm looking at, we left some points on the board um, for as brilliant uh, as Jimmy Horn Jr. was, he drops the one in the flat that he's probably still running. He scores a touchdown on uh, a great call, comes in motion. Shadur hits him in the flat. He just drops it. No one around. You, you get those plays every now and then. But I do think this offense is going to be perfectly fine. As I mentioned uh, at, at a moment ago, I, I'm curious to see how stout our defensive front seven can be against the Nebraska team that I think is going to try and absolutely run it down our throats with that good quarterback. I know we'll talk more about that, but I think they're going to really try and test our metal up front. The last thing I'll say as an overall overview of the game, um, if there is a, a I guess a, a somewhat of a critique of our offense, I would love to see us 10 plays where the quarterback is taking the ball from taking a snap from center, not in shotgun. 10 plays where we're actually playing with a tight end. Uh, I think that could make our offensive passing game even more explosive, uh, exploiting the middle of the field a little bit more. I think those are two areas that uh, I would love to see whether or not we'll make an adjustment on. When I see four wide with a single back and it's just five linemen, I'm like, okay, all right. Now this is leaving us a little bit naked up front. But uh, – Overall, Chad, I'm, I'll, I'll give us a B, a solid B coming out of uh, the game against North Dakota State. Okay, I'll go with a B minus because I thought I would see more improvement from the offensive line as far as the run game. Save up one sack, man. I'm with you on that. As far as the run game, you got to let me finish the sentence there, my friend. Okay. And then that defensive front, you know, give up 175 yards rushing. I think Matt Rule in Nebraska is looking at that as their that's, – that's their leg up. We can run the ball. We can control the pace and the flow of the game. You know, there was a lot of explosive plays for CU, which is great. But if you have an explosive plays, you're not controlling the flow of the game. While the defense doesn't want to give up quick scores, certainly, uh, it's more demoralizing for a defense to give up a 13 or 15 play drive where you just ram it down their throats. 
I'm not saying Pat Shermer is wrong to draw explosive plays. I'm not saying Shador is wrong to go for the open guy down the middle of the field. When someone's playing cover two and they're allowing your receiver to go down the middle of the field, you throw it to him. You take what the defense gives you. But again, if I'm going to find some critiques that I think could rear their head later in the season against a more even competitive opponent, those are things that, that, that I worry about is – your ability to not live and die by explosives, but to consistently drive the football, your offensive line to power a run game where occasionally, not all game long, but occasionally you impose your will. And yeah. defensively, you've got to be able to stop the run game and and, and limit their, their, their run possibilities. I think you're absolutely right. There's no question about that. I think those are two areas that see you have to show. And you know, and you know better than anyone, Chad, that the growth. I'm so excited to see what happens week two. You got one under your belt. Like you said, there, there's no preseason in college football. Uh, you don't, I, every coach in the country, when they, when they kick off for the first time, unless you're playing St. Augustine Junior College, you are concerned about, you don't know what you don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, you don't know what's going to happen. From this point forward, exactly. From this point forward, Every coach going into the second game is actually coaching from a perspective of knowing something about their team. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's no secret that what you and I just talked about, Prime and that coaching staff up in Boulder knows that these are areas we have to sure up. I'm really curious and interested to see what it looks like this upcoming week. If I have to commit an extra body just to make sure uh, they're not chewing us up in that run game. I'm, I'm doing that. All right. Another part of this kind of review situation is uh, the coaching staff. We had new coordinators. Well, brand, damn near a brand new coaching staff up the bottom, but certainly new coordinators on both sides of the ball. And Prime had a press conference today where he talked about the staff. So I love the staff, man. I love their not just experience of football, but their experience in life with men and young men. I love the way they handle certain situations. I really do. Um, That's why I love pros, man. And those guys are professional. They're handling these young men like they're professional. And we tell these guys every day, um, 31 scouts there. We had, I think, several scouts in practice today. And that's an everyday thing. How could you not want this? How can you not want to be a part of this? How can you not want to perform for this? If you say you want to go to the NFL and you got guys out here every day that can make that happen, what else do you want in life? So that's what we are. And I'm, I'm proud of the coaching staff as well as the young men. All right. So uh, give me your just real quick review on the game management from Coach Prime and then the play calling offensively and defensively. Yeah. First first thing I got to acknowledge, man, and, and I love it, it's subtle, but it's obvious. That guy is always recruiting. Yes. When he says, hey, 31 scouts, how many teams are in the NFL? That means – all but one, all but one team. If I'm, if my math is right, was right here, y'all. All 31. So if you want, if you want to be seen, you come in. And by the way, my coordinators, I love these NFL guys. They're pros, right? You, the guy is always recruiting, and I think it's one of those subtleties that people kind of miss. Uh, it sounds like arrogance to some. Uh, but he's recruiting, <laughs> and I, I appreciate that. You you mentioned it, and I know we'll get into it a little bit more. I think Shador may be may very well. I think he's the best quarterback in the country. He hit Jimmy Horn on that deep post route that he scored a touchdown on, and he was he had this much room to make that throw in. I mean, he had like no room to do. It. He didn't flinch. He delivered a strike, and I've seen him do that uh, uh, all preseason and all this year. I still would like to see a tight end. I would love to see some. If not to to boost the run the run game on second down to ease, at least give a run threat look um, and get him in the passing game a little bit. Speaking of the tight end, those are my only two uh, real critiques of of what I saw week one. Now, obviously, offensively, I think you're on to something with the traditional pro set with a tight end, a quarterback under center. Even if you're going to pass out of that, the defense has to respect that. And right. then from a personnel standpoint, once you put a tight end on the field, then they've got a linebacker on the field. And now you've got a slower defense you're dealing with if you want to pass the ball. Also, if you want to go with play action and go with an all block and get Travis Hunter one-on-one -on -one or Horn one-on-one -on -one with a defensive back down the field, well, that's how you do it. You get that defense to commit up and go with that look, that, that quarterback under center, tight end, you know, connected to a, a tackle. 
or that opportunity to go all block is exists there. And that's how you can manufacture some players off of play action. Yeah. And, and then defensively, your ability to constantly change things up. You show any coordinator in major college football that you're a man team. Anybody who plays man knows there are route combinations called man beaters. Right. I mean, they, and and they, there's a reason why they call them that because they beat man coverage. And to your point as well, if you've got a pass rush that is maybe not as disciplined or as good as we would expect them to be, be five or six games down the, the, the road, once that quarterback escapes the pocket and everyone's got their back turned, it's going to you know end up being a, a first down, potentially a 20 plus yard game. So there's a couple of schematic things I would tweak as well. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, conversation, controversy about Shadour not recognizing the situation on the field late in the ball game. I'm thankful. I'm excited for a win, but there's definitely situations in that game I personally could have handled better. It's throws, you know, I could have made. It's check downs I could have got to. So uh, really the main goal tonight is just recover a little bit and watch the film and see where we got to improve. So so here's my observation. You you, you are, I, I love watch, listening to your analysis of football because there are not many defensive guys who actually know football, like really know football. You, usually the defensive guys just, like, uh, yeah, you're just, just talking, not really making much sense. But you actually make sense, Chad. You must play some offense in your high school somewhere along the line. I did. I told the Rock I was nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I, it, I knew it had to be. Now that said, it's my understanding Shadur wanted to get his boy some love. I thought that was a momentary lapse of maturity on Shadur's part. Got to call my man out on this one. I get the instinct. You got a mismatch on the perimeter. And you're like, there's no way. And quite frankly, if Shador throws it, if he leads him the way, you know, if he throws a nice pass, he, it's a touchdown. But you don't do that, right? I think this was a learning situation for Shador, I hope, that uh, you can't get ahead of the right thing to do in that moment. You're the quarterback. We can't afford to have that kind of, of uh, judgment lapse in that situation. And, so, and, and that could reflect back on the coaching staff, right? Like, would it you, I would be scared. There's no way I would even think to do something like that in a Mac, you know, I mean, I wouldn't, I couldn't imagine what would happen to me. So that said, I think it was, a, I hope it was a learning moment for him. It was a lapse of judgment, no doubt about it. Um, it could have cost us the game, quite frankly, it didn't. Um, um, so that's, that's my assessment on that. I don't want to go too far with it. But I do think it's worth being called out. Okay. I'm happy that Shador apologized and said, you know, I don't make too many mistakes twice. I'm going to learn from that one. And that's what you should as a player. That's right. Make a mistake. We don't want to pay that same ground again next week. Check that shit off the list. Do not be a mistake repeater. Having said all that, I think you touched on the coaching staff. And this may be going a little, coming at it from a, not the most flattering of angles here. Well, you're about to sound like a defender. Go ahead. When there's so many things around this program that aren't directly focused on winning, that are focused on likes and numbers and all these other things that swirl around this program constantly, can we be a bit surprised that a quarterback in that situation would make that move that would put him over 500 yards for the game that would get his boy some shine to get over 100 yards for the game where the numbers which are constantly discussed in this program various numbers of various types here i'm gonna play a clip here in a second in some cases seem to be more important than achieving victory you and i we were so coached culturally not only did we just never go counter to what coaches would ever want and think we've got the green light to do anything like that. That wasn't a part of our culture. We were always about winning. So for this coaching staff, which has, you know, all the things that have surrounded this program for the last year plus, mm -hmm. is it possible that winning has gotten, I won't say completely lost, but sometimes in some ways gets bumped down the priority list where a decision like that could be made? No. I, I I completely disagree with okay. you. Okay. Okay. I completely disagree with you because here, here here is my perspective on that. There were probably untold number of plays 
and decisions that Shador made on that field that no one knows that put CU in a better position to be productive. I'm not, I'm going to always push back against a broad, a broader narrative. And I don't think Coach Prime or anything plays to that. I, I think, I think in today's college football game, they're always, you're, you're always playing a number of different types of games. One, the recruiting game. That's always kind of been true with, with, with college football. Um, that's why you see teams will actually split time at quarterback with players who may not be ready, but they recruited them and they were high, high recruits, right? I mean, we see it all the time, compromising a team's chance to win games, quite frankly, because you're always playing this balancing act. And so I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, go along with the narrative that suggests that CU is, that winning might be a little bit less important because likes are more important. I'm not going there. Now, I would say that that situation right there has to be checked up and checked up aggressively because the game was in the balance and the, that decision could have been extremely costly. I don't think the kid makes the same mistake twice, uh, a learning opportunity from it. Uh, and I, I believe, as I've been around the program, just as you have, that they want nothing more, nothing more than to win. There was a play, I, you may have seen it, we may even have the clip, when before the amazing last touchdown that Shadur threw to... Um, Hunter, when he, when he reached back over his head and grabbed yeah, that? Yeah, 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 that play. Mm -hmm. Remember, there was, he, he threw one, I think in the sequence earlier, where he missed it. Yes. And there was a break in the action and Shadour went at him. Yep. Like catch the damn ball. And then he offered up some excuse and he came back, just catch the damn ball. Right. He went at him. I, that was, that was the best clip I've seen all weekend because th there was a tension there that there's an urgency to win this damn game. And there are no excuses. Can you talk about the one touchdown catch you had where the guy pretty much <laughs> had, his, had his arm around your, your head a little bit. Can you talk about that one in particular. Uh, it's funny because he got on me for not catching the one that we called a flag because I told him to throw me the ball no matter what. So he got mad at me. He was like, I don't care, catch the ball. So that one, I just knew I had to catch the ball. I had no other choice, no other option. So whatever I had to do to get the ball, I was going to get it. That, that's exactly what I'm talking about right there. Hey, look at my boy Dylan, man. Dylan. The man behind the scenes. That's that X. All that's, X. that's X. And whenever we say his name, we got to get – That's the time. You got to throw up the X? Like X playing is what we're doing now? <laughs> Okay, but that, but that, that right there is what I'm talking about, and so that's my point. I, I, you know, again, all the narrative stuff, and I know there's a bunch of noise around the program and people analysis around whether or not what's important. These guys, Prime is a this, this dude is a winner, man. I mean, he, he wants nothing more than to win. Shadur watching him and how these guys compete. Chad, I think it's a mistake to suggest that anything else is first and foremost for this program than winning football games. Okay. Well, uh, X, call up that numbers clip from this today, please. TV ratings, 4.8 million viewers, peaked at 5.6 million. That lets you know that uh, our fan base is real. Our fan base is real. And whether you like it or not, you want to see it. And I'm thankful for I feel as though we have one of the best, if not the best, fan base in the country. Uh, Shador, the company with Patrick Mahomes, the last 20 years, 400 passing yards for a touchdown, back to back season. Over. Jimmy Horn was phenomenal. Phenomenal. 198 yards. I'm upset that I didn't know because we'd have got a 200. Mm -hmm. But look, Travis Hunter is Travis. Uh, 131 snaps. Showed no signs of tiring. He is who he is. He is the definition of him. Uh, 31 NFL scouts. Represented 19 teams on Thursday. Uh, no scouts in attendance to see history. And our man, Xavier Weaver, made the 53 man roster, and that's not an easy task, especially with the condition that he suffered at the conclusion of the season, man. So I'm proud of him. Okay. So now, of course, this was later on in his opening montage. He talked about the win and all that first. Here you go. But, but, but it speaks to these numbers that are outside of, of winning. And again, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everyone's different. Nick Saban, I don't think he ever talked about viewership. 
because Alabama won. They knew the viewers were going to be there. Right. Nick Saban probably never talked about scouts at a press conference because it's Alabama. Scouts are going to be there. All these numbers, all these scouts, television numbers, all that stuff, these are new for CU or at least part of a, a, a new time for CU. Um, so is that a coach recruiting mm-hmm. or is that somebody who's focused on things that are outside of winning. That's a coach who's about his business. Mm-hmm. He's about his business. He knows exactly what's happening here. And when he gives a shout out to his receiver of a year ago for making a 53 man roster, of course, that's hard felt, but he's also signaling to an incoming class or recruiting class that's out there in a living room somewhere that his staff will be visiting soon that this is what we produce. Right. When he gives it the numbers. Right. It, it's I mean, those are eye popping. That's eye popping stuff. No, Nick Saban doesn't have to do it because he just doesn't. It speaks for itself. It doesn't speak for itself at Colorado. Our brand isn't that he's building that brand um, three years from now. If we get this thing going and let's say we win three more games this year than we won last year. We're at seven. And let's mm-hmm. say the following year we're at 10. We're in the thick of it. He won't have to recite those numbers. We'll become, once again, a household brand on the college football landscape. And this is where he don't get credit. He doesn't get credit for being better at his business than just about anyone else in the country when it comes to setting the atmosphere, creating, signaling, and messaging the atmosphere where young men want to come, the top players in the country might want to come play despite the lack of any recent sustainable success from the program. No one in the country does it better. He doesn't get credit for it. And I think in part because there's a built-in reticence. Um, some call it just hate. Uh, I think a lot of folks are hating on him. But I, I see what's happening there, and I give him credit for it. Again, some, some folks are going to look at that numbers part of the press conference and come up with the narrative that I've you know introduced in my question. I don't necessarily feel that way. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not letting you off the hook that easy, man. You just hit me with some, I know it's political season and, you right. know, we're getting a lot of speeches from CNN and, 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 you know, all over the place. Now, you just said, I don't necessarily buy into that narrative of the numbers being a, I have a great deal of respect, man, for your mm-hmm. opinion. I need to hear it. I don't, I don't want no, I don't necessarily believe stuff. Come on, CB. That's not okay. how you've known for over 35 years. All right. I can only look at life through my eyes. I do not have the bandwidth to be thinking about the number of tackles I've had in a ball game and somehow incorporate that into my thoughts. The ball is snapped. That snap deserves 100% of my attention. And then the next snap coming up, well, shit, I just got up off the ground. What down distance is it? What personnel is it? What's our defensive call? What's my responsibility versus run? What's my responsibility versus pass? What if they come in empty? What are we doing versus that? I don't have time for all that. Other people may be better at that than I am. So if the numbers were to creep into my head as the game is going along, if I am thinking about, well, let me funnel this running back to Greg Beaker so he can make a tackle so he can get 20 tackles, that wouldn't work for me. I would be less than the player than I was if I operated like that. So to think, oh, as a play caller, I need to give Jimmy Horn one more pass so we can get over 200. The game was not sealed away. I understand you got, you're up by 21 points against Kansas State. Yes, then Alfred Williams, maybe the greatest defender in CU history, he can go out and play tight end and, get, and catch a ball. That actually happened. That was real. He's still mad at me, by the way, for that. Because it, it was not a well-thrown ball. He, no, 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 no. BJ threw okay. the pass to Al. The, the play before, I threw it to Canavis. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Al said, we're in the huddle. He was like, I know you're going to throw it to your frat brother. I know you're going to throw it to your frat brother. And Canavis, the ball hit him all in the head and incomplete pass. BJ threw it to Al, and Al went up and made a great catch. Yes. So, uh, but yeah, your point, to your point. Okay, so once we start doing those things, that gives space, that gives room for those folks who may hear that bit about the numbers from the press conference, room to say, look, winning is not the only thing. Winning is not things one through five and everything else falls below that. 
we are actually thinking about, oh, my boy hasn't got enough shine. Let me get him a football in this critical situation. We just need to kneel down and win the football game. So there's space for that because of those kind of comments. But I hear where you're coming from, from a recruiting standpoint, from a, a building of the brand standpoint. I don't think you're wrong. Those folks who take that space and run with it, I think they're looking at it from a wrong angle. But I, I, I think Coach Prime needs to understand that those folks who are coming up with that, there is enough ammunition for them to create that narrative yeah. based on the things that they've seen. Yeah. While the heart behind it may be different and the intent may be different, it does create that wiggle room for somebody with a negative outlook to wiggle in there and say, see, they're not all about winning. It's not number one for them. No, I hear you. And I think there are folks, plenty of them, who have a predisposition to have that position. You know, I, I'm not certain that it's worth the time for this coaching staff to even consider that, right? I mean, the, the business, you think about the things that we talk about on this show and how many elements and ways that it can be twisted and looked at. And it, you, you talk about bandwidth. I'm not certain that a staff has the bandwidth to actually consider all those things. If someone wants to take a, a negative approach to a decision that's being made, you got to kind of let them have it because here's my, here's the bottom line, Chad, you know, better than anyone. It doesn't matter what people say, either you win or you lose ultimately. And winners are going to be retained and given credit and losers are going, and they're not long for it. Um, so that's, it's kind of the one thing I appreciate about coaches generally, whether the world loves you or hate you in the end, I don't know that there's a more hated probably coach in the history of professional football than Bill Belichick nationally. Mm -hmm. I don't think that he ever cared that anyone didn't like him. He just went about the business of winning football games. Um, and this program and this coaching staff will be judged on that as well. So, you know, the narrative is set. All right. Last question. My last snaps as a football player occurred in a Patriots versus Jets game late in the season, week 13, week 14, somewhere around there. By the way, man, let me just point out, you say your last snap. I think your first snap, you played so damn long. I think it was a 12-game season when you took your first <laughs> And then a 17-game season when you took your last snap. Chad, how many years did you play, man? I played 15 years. I did a full five at CU. You know, uh, right. at the tail end of my career, I was with Junior Seau with the Patriots. And we sat, we shared a table in the linebacker mm -hmm. room. Late grade, so, yeah. Bill Belichick got every linebacker who had 10 years plus a rocking chair. So Junior and I would sit in the rocking chairs in the back of that meeting. And one day I asked Junior, I was like, how many games did you play at USC? I think he played 18 games at USC. Really? I, I I was like, dude, I gave away two years of NFL football playing for CU because I played like 50 plus games in my time there. Listen, two years, that's that's probably, if you could go back, that's probably about two and a half, three million dollars. Yeah, I, I, I could use that right now. But well, I mean, you know, I, I, I but my point yeah. is here, I got my ass kicked <laughs> on special teams as a 37 year old linebacker. Wow. There have been very few have had their last game and their last football moments to be the absolute tops for their career or for that particular season. John Elway retired after back-to-back -back Super Bowls as a Denver Bronco. Jerome Bettis, not only did the bus stop, Jerome Bettis the bus stop in Detroit, the Pittsburgh Steelers Super Bowl win was in Detroit. So the bus stopped in Detroit as a Super Bowl champion. But my point is, most people have their football experience similar to mine. Some nondescript way of going out where you your glory days were years before. Chad, As I alluded to earlier in the show, your last football game was the national championship for the Colorado Buffalo. That's Maybe right. your greatest moment as a Colorado Buffalo, not just because of the moment itself, the Orange Bowl, but your greatest game was in the Orange Bowl. When you think about your football experience, to tie it up in that kind of way, 
Um, just, just give me your thoughts. Give me your reflections upon your seizing of the moment, seizing of the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a that's a, a great question. And, you know, life life happens in real time. So it's never as we talked about at the beginning of the show, it's never a script. Right. You don't know how this thing is going to unfold. Uh, there could have not been a clip called mm -hmm. against, you know, uh, Notre Dame when the rocket ran it back. I mean, that would have changed the whole narrative. Right. To some degree, completely changed the narrative. And so you, you never know how it unfolds, given that. Over time, Chad, it took me years. And even to this day, I'm still, you know, you still sort of process it. And when you're in different stages in life, you think back and it means something different. Like, I'm not even sure I fully appreciate the, the narrative that you just listed there or just, just articulated. Um, it was a game, right? And when you're in it, as you know, you're just trying to you're trying to advance the ball like an offensive player and your defensive player, you're trying to stop it. That's the bottom line. And, and you string those events together and sometimes it ends in your favor and sometimes it don't. Um, but then you paint the whole picture around it. It was because of that game that I was a guest on the tonight show with Jay Leno. It was because of that game that, you know, there was a, a full LA times sort of article on sort of my my career, right? I mean, there are so many things that took place as an outcome of that instance that um, that you just mentioned that, again, I started out as a very relatively lightly recruited, undersized quarterback from Detroit, who walked on, by the way. I say all that to say I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And in a way, it's, it's really for the world to sort of analyze and 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 place right for me it's 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 just one of the instances and i know you've experienced this in your life people come and tell you how how magnificent that must have been or how incredible that must have been or how you feel about that and you have a thought about it clearly but the world tends to define moments and things for you that you might not define in that exact same way your football character is revealed in moments like that. My last year in New England, and I cried as a grown man in his office and talked about, this is the hardest football thing I have ever done. Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you cried figuratively, right? Like you didn't no. cry real tears, like real tears? Tears came out of my eyes as I described to this man how difficult this football experience was. I'm a backup linebacker. I've got Bill Belichick who expects me to know everything. Yet in a 10 or 12 play period during practice, I may get one or two of those plays. And you expect me to know everything, to perform it perfectly. And for all my life as a football player, I had been a starter. So I got eight or 10 of those plays. And when I screwed it up, no one yelled at me. They just put it in the next practice so Chad could get another chance to get it perfect. So in that moment, walking out of his office, I was like, oh, shit. This is how everyone else who's not as lucky as I am has been living through their football experience. Yeah. And now my experience has come full circle. Mm. You know, all those teammates who I have had when they walk into the huddle when the starter went down, and the only thing I had to say to them was, don't you F this up. I certainly had a much deeper appreciation for, for them as a player, for their football character, for them as a human being to show that level of perseverance and that level of investment without getting the constant reward back. But again, it speaks to your character as, 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 as a young man back then. Um, but again, to your football character to continue to invest without the likelihood of a reward coming. Um, I have such a deep appreciation for those who were able to pull it off because I was a 37-year-old man and it broke me down to tears. This love fest that is organic and natural, we have one thing I can tell you all about Chad and CJ is that this has been our relationship in some form or fashion for over 35 years. There's a mutual admiration for one another uh, and it's been it's sustained itself over the years. But I'm not gonna let you keep buttering me up. You know I want to get after you. You know I want to get after you on them. I'm gonna start getting after you on some of these shows. Every time I take a shot, 
you butter me up, man. And, you know, I feel like I'm in Matt Patricia's office, you know, snot booger crying. You Look, man, I'm not going to, we going to, we're going to give love where love is due, but this, uh, 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 bro, I know what you're doing. All right. Well, good enough. We will leave this one here. We got something coming up later this week. We're going to preview the Nebraska game. I'm sure you and I will dive into the Nebraska games of the past. Um, you know, give it to us to end this Black and Gold Brothers podcast. <laughs> what, 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 what does the end on the Nebraska helmet stands for? Yep. Knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see y'all later this week. Thanks for tuning in to BGB.